If you will take your Bibles and turn to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 6. Matthew, chapter number 6. See, for the past little while now, I have been, or I find myself studying more and more the Lord's Sermon on the Mount, and that's what we are looking at here in Matthew 6. Very familiar words. I just want us to see it in light of discipleship, which we also have been talking about over the last weeks. But Matthew 6, beginning at verse number 19 and reading down through verse 24, Jesus says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is clear, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is the darkness No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. The whole sermon, really, over the last several weeks as I've been looking at it, has captured my attention and has really deepened my understanding of what discipleship really is and what the life of the disciple is is like. At the very outset of our Lord's sermon here, I was even even drawn by the occasion that He walks up into a mountain and He sits down and His immediate disciples come to Him and surround Him and sit around Him and He begins His sermon but in the hearing of a large crowd as well. His disciples are sitting, as it were, at his feet, and they are totally absorbed in what he is teaching. They want to know the truth coming from the Savior. And so he begins the sermon by describing how the disciple community, how the true followers and the faithful followers of Christ are made visible. And we just sang about that. I I noted that as we were singing at the end of this, or towards the end of the second stanza, we are joined as one body that Christ would be seen by all. And so Jesus is preaching, begins this very message, and gives the means by which the community of disciples would be made visible. People say that they are followers of Jesus Christ. Many would say that. The question is, how do they verify that? How do others know that one is a true follower, a true disciple of Jesus Christ? How does following Jesus Christ become evident? And the answer given through the Beatitudes in this first chapter of our Lord's Sermon is that it becomes evident in the character of the disciple. That the disciple is poor in spirit, humble. That he's repentant, he he mourns his sin, that he is gentle or meek. He does not hold on to his rights, even his dignity and his honor. That he is righteous, that he hungers for righteousness, that he is merciful, that he is pure in heart, single-minded, 
totally devoted to his Lord, that he is a peace seeker as well as a peacemaker, and that his life becomes convicting to those around whose lives do not measure up to the righteousness of, of Christ. These very characteristics then describe the disciple and make him visible before others. Not that that is his primary goal to somehow make himself known as the Pharisees would do with their garb and the way that they would pray and the way that they would fast. But nevertheless, they would become visible to those who were looking in. And in fact, Jesus would want them to be that. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So the motivation for being visible would not be that they themselves would be made known, but that Jesus Christ and that God would be made known and exalted. So these are the traits that identify true followers of Jesus Christ, that identify the true disciples. But the visibility of the life of the disciple is not without challenge. It is what we are to be like. Our lives should display who we are. We're Christian. It should reflect that. It's not just a life that is moral. It is a life that is transformed. And it's it's transformed from within. Our character is changed. We are, as we have seen, new creatures in Christ Jesus. Therefore, this should be made manifest. It should be visible. But this visibility, as I said, is challenged. The disciples' great enemies, Satan, the flesh, the world, continuously seek to derail the life of the disciple. Even earthly goods can do that. And we got a kind of a glimpse of that. And, and I want to ask you to turn back to the Scripture reading in, in John chapter 21. John 21, but we got a glimpse of at least this last kind of threat, this this idea that even good things can derail one's discipleship. We see this in the conversation that our Lord has with Peter. John's account recounts really a post-resurrection encounter, an encounter between the risen Jesus Christ And Peter, at the front of chapter 21, you may recall, Peter is sort of in conflict. Even after seeing the risen Christ, he's in conflict as to what to do. And as the leader of the disciples, he decides he's going to take up his profession of being a fisherman and go fishing. It wasn't like, let's go for a weekend of fishing. Let's get out on the James River and see if we can catch some rockfish or whatever else is out there. That's not the kind of fishing he was talking about. He wanted to go back to his profession. Jesus in his wonderful grace in this post-resurrection appearance and encounter wants to woo Peter back to the task. And so he confronts Peter in a loving way and begins his conversation with Peter by probing the apostles' devotion to him. And so he asks Peter, Peter, do you love me more than these? And with that, he was not talking to Peter in relation to the other disciples. Do you love me more than these disciples love me? But rather, I think, Peter, do you love me more than these fish? Quite challenging to Peter. Jesus says, Peter, do you love me? Peter says, yes, Lord. And he actually concludes with having to ask, having to say to the Lord, yes, Lord, you know the truth about me. You know I love you. And then Jesus says to Peter three times, In essence, Peter, feed my sheep, shepherd my sheep. 
He was basically saying, Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Then follow my command, feed my sheep. Love me and show your devotion to me by doing what I require of you. Feed my sheep. And then in verses 18 and 19, the Lord does the unusual. He turns to Peter and he prophesies and tells Peter what's going to happen to him. He basically tells Peter, Peter, you will be martyred. And custom or tradition says that Peter was, in fact, crucified upside down. We see it again in verses 18 and 19. Truly, truly, Jesus says, I say to you, when you were younger, you used to gird yourself and walk wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will gird you and bring you where you do not wish to go. And he did that signifying by what kind of death he would glorify God. And so let me just stop and just remind all of us that day after day, it is our journey towards this end called death. There is no going back. Every time you wish I were younger or think in terms of I wish I had more years just remember all of those are reminders that we're headed towards this one end, and that is, in this life, we die. We're all going there. But notice exactly what the Lord says in relation to that when he says there in verse 19, he tells Peter these things and the kind of death that he would die were for the glory of God. So what the Lord permitted to take place in Peter's life was still intended to be used to glorify God. And that is true for the saints of all time. Our deaths and the manner by which God permits us to move in that direction is still to be to the glory of God. And we should think of it that way. It's our last shot at glorifying Him on this earth. And so let's die well as Christians. So Jesus does this unusual thing and prophesies about Peter's death. And then with that, He turns to Peter again and He says, and gives really a very simple call of discipleship in verse 19. This is how you're going to die. He says, nevertheless, follow me. It was all so plain. Peter, here's your assignment. Feed the sheep. And Peter, here's where all of this will take you. Death by crucifixion. Nevertheless, Peter, follow me. Peter, follow me. Immediately, however, this life of discipleship that the Lord tailors for Peter. And by the way, our discipleship is tailored individually for each one of us. Tailored for Peter. Immediately it was threatened. We see it in verse 20 and 20, 20 through 22. Peter turned around and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved, the apostle John, following them, the one who also had leaned back on his breast at the supper and said, Lord, who's the, he said, Lord, who is the one who betrays you? Peter, therefore, seeing him, said to Jesus, Lord, and what about this man? Peter's focus turns to a matter that really did not concern him. What about John? Will John be martyred? How and will John be killed? How will he die? Lord, how will he serve you? 
And Jesus turns to Peter again to remind him of the meaning of discipleship. He says in verse 22, if I want him to remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. What is it to you what happens to this disciple of mine? You be my disciple. You follow me. So this meant that Peter would have to guard his devotion to the Lord. After the Lord clearly told him what the simple call of discipleship was, follow me, Peter's attention is drawn to the disciple. Jesus reminds him, take your eyes off of John and keep them on me. You follow me. So it tells us that Peter is going to have to guard his devotion to the Lord. He was not to be drawn aside by good things, even the service of others, and looking at them. His discipleship was not to be derailed, even by good things in themselves, even by the concerns of another's service or, or perhaps their well-being. And so the episode, I think, reminds us or highlights for us a need in the life of a disciple the need for maintaining discipleship. There's the need because one can consciously or not get derailed. And so the disciple must keep his focus on Christ. And early on in our Christian lives, this was a problem for all of us. I think just to one degree or another, we would go to a meeting perhaps and be stirred by the Word of God and, and our hearts would be warmed by the truth and, and perhaps we got a fresh glimpse of the Lord Jesus and our eyes were on Him. And for a little while, things really seemed to go well in our Christian walk and then things sort of started to wane and our interest in Christ seemed to be uh, somewhat dampened and, and all of a sudden we find ourselves instead of on a peak going down into a valley, and we wonder what's going on in our Christian life, and and so we see a kind of roller coaster experience. On again, off again for Christ. The disciple must keep his focus on Christ in order to avoid the on again and off again experiences that so easily come our way in this world. Well, the question then becomes, how do you maintain discipleship? And let me put the answer to that in a propositional form with a negative. Discipleship is maintained. Following Jesus Christ is maintained when the disciple permits nothing to come between himself and Christ. It is maintained when the disciple allows and permits nothing to come between himself and Jesus Christ. No sin, no relationship, no earthly good, no thing. And we see this most basic but really profound propositional statement expounded upon through three teachings in our text back in Matthew chapter 6. The first deals with the disciples' securities, his treasures, in verses 19 through 21. The second deals with the disciples' spiritual sight, in verse 22 through 23. And then the third deals with the disciples' service. The disciples' securities, the disciples' spiritual sight, the disciples' service. First, the disciples' securities. In verses 19 through 21. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. These verses really force the disciple, they force the one who follows Jesus Christ to ask himself, To what am I really devoted? To what 
am I really devoted? Am I devoted to Christ or am I devoted to earthly goods? Am I devoted to material things? Am I devoted to some other relationship rather than my relationship with Jesus Christ? And our Lord's teaching indicates that material possessions or earthly goods can readily come between the disciple and his Lord. Therefore, Jesus gives the warning there in verse 19. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break through and steal. Because material things and material possessions can draw and entice and lure one away from Jesus Christ. They promise much. Often they promise much. This is where satisfaction is. This is where happiness is. This is where security is. This is where your trust should be. This is where your comfort will come from. They promise much. They promise security. But they fail because they're temporary. Moth and rust destroy and thieves break in and steal. This is why Jesus gives the exhortation that he does in verse 20. Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy and where thieves do not break through or steal. As Christians then, as, as disciples of our Lord Jesus Christ, we must be careful not to draw unwarranted conclusions from all of this. Jesus is not teaching that having material possessions is wrong or bad. It's a good thing because all of us have those. He's not teaching that. He's not teaching that having material things are bad. We live in a material world. We function in a material world. We are in need of material things. We need food. We need clothing. We need shelter, etc., this is still God's earth. God has richly given us all things to enjoy. So being fully Christian and fully human, we live in this material world. Jesus is not saying that all material possessions need to go, that you need to go find a monastery and become a monk. What he is concerned with is how these things can affect the disciples' heart devotion to him. And so in verse 21, he says, For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. We need material things so they are not to be scorned. But what happens when material things and treasures are hoarded, when they become our trust? when our comfort and security is in them, when they are not used as directed by God, what happens then? Well, let's look at an example, an Old Testament example found in the book of Exodus in chapter number 16. Exodus 16, you know the story, but let's all turn there for practice. No scrolling, turning. Here are the pages. Okay. Exodus 16, I'll just begin reading in verse 1, read down through verse 5, and then we're going to jump over to verse 13 and, and see the story unfold there. Then they set out from Elam, and all the congregation of the sons of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin which is between Elam and Sinai on the 15th day of the second month after their departure from the land of Egypt. And the whole congregation of the sons of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the sons of Israel said to them, Would that we had died by the Lord's hand in the land of Egypt when we sat by the pots of meat, when we ate bread to the full. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. And then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a food, a day's portion every day, that I may test them whether or not they will walk in my instruction. So I'm going to send, I'm going to send 
divine provision to test the Israelites' hearts. And it will come about on the fifth, on the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather daily. Then over to verse 13. And so it came about at evening that the quails came up and covered the camp. And in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. And when the layer of dew evaporated, behold, on the surface of the wilderness, there was a fine flake-like thing, fine as the frost on the ground. And when the sons of Israel saw it, they said to one another, what is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, it is the bread which the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord had commanded. Gather of it every man as much as he should eat. You shall take an omer apiece according to the number of persons each of you has in, your, in his tent. And the sons of Israel did so. And some gathered much and some little. And when they measured it with an omer, He who had gathered much had no excess, and he who had gathered little had no lack. Every man gathered as much as he should eat. And Moses said to them, let no man leave any of it until morning. But they did not listen to Moses. And some left part of it until morning, and it bred worms and became foul, and Moses was angry with them. And they gathered it morning by morning, every man as much as he should eat. But when the sun grew hot, it would melt. These treasures then of the disciple with that story in mind can become a, betray- can become a, a barrier between the disciple and his Lord unless they are properly unless they are properly used and used according to the Lord. For Jesus says, where your treasure is, so will be your trust, so will be your security, so will be your comfort, so will be your God. Little g. Our treasure then has just become an idol when it becomes what we trust in and find our comfort in. It is then stepped between the disciple and Christ. Now for us, I think it would be interesting to know, and you would be interested to know, how did this disciple draw the line? How do we draw draw the line between our earthly goods and our discipleship and devotion to Christ? How do we know? How does the disciple discern when a lawful use of material things bleeds over into an unlawful amassing of some earthly goods. Look again at verse 21. Again, Jesus said, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So to aid our discerning, it will come when we just reverse or flip the verse around to read this. For where your heart is, there will your treasure be also. That's the key. Where is your heart? To what or to whom is your heart devoted? If the heart is devoted to Christ, then like the Israelites, obedience to Christ will be unimpeded. They will follow the commands of Moses. They will gather what they should eat for that day. They will leave none to breed worms. If, on the other hand, it is devoted to material possessions, some earthly good, a legitimate good even, then obedience to Christ and His Word will be impeded. So Christ's first teaching concerning maintaining discipleship dealt with the disciples' security, their treasures. His second teaching deals with the disciples' spiritual sight in verses 22 and 23. The lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is clear, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? And Jesus says in verse 22 that the physical eye, the physical eye is the lamp or light of the physical body. 
If the eyesight is healthy, then the body will function at its highest level. The whole body will be full of light. But if the vision is in some way impaired, either by being double or clouded or blinded altogether, then the light needed for the body is diminished. The hand may reach for something and knock it over trying to grasp it. Have you ever done that? You ever done that when, when you had inferior or insufficient lighting and you reach for something and you sort of missed it and bumped it and knocked it over and said, I know you did. I know you've done that. Don't even need to ask. It's a rhetorical question. The feet may stumble. If there's no light because of blindness, then the whole body is in darkness. And we all know how difficult it is to navigate safely when everything is dark. I get up in the middle of the night. I make sure I grab the chairs back until I get the light on. I do that in case the chair gets knocked over. I do that so that I don't stumble around in the dark. And you do similar things, don't you? You memorize your rooms, in fact. You make sure that I, I know exactly where everything is. And when something gets placed out of, out of whack, usually you stub your toe or you fall over it and then you have a discussion with your loved one. The same thing is true in the spiritual realm as well. The disciples walk with the Lord when it is healthy, when his spiritual sight is unimpaired. That's when his walk is, is uninterrupted. Then he sees the Lord clearly and can follow as he should. And once again then, the heart comes into the picture because the spiritual sight of the disciple is his heart. Jesus said, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Our spiritual sight is and revolves around the heart. So if the heart is not single, if it is not pure, if it is not wholly devoted to the Lord, if it is not uncorrupted, then the light getting through will be impeded and it will be diminished or blocked. And by that I mean that the way our Lord leads will become unclear, will become fuzzy, and maybe even undetectable. Following Him will be obstructed if our hearts are not pure. And what light is it that Jesus gives? He sends us or gives us His Word, right? Thy Word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path, unto my path. Or as Jesus said in John 10, my sheep Hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. In other words, when the heart is darkened, when it is not pure, when it is not single, when it is not clear, when it is focused on worldly possessions or things other than the Lord, following Christ will be hindered as though one is walking through a fog. So how crucial it is, brothers and sisters, for us to guard our hearts. How crucial it is to not allow the world to capture our hearts and and thereby undercut our discipleship, undercut our following Christ and making our discipleship impaired as a result of being sidetracked with a misdirected focus. So this Lord's second teaching deals with the disciples' spiritual sight. Jesus continues to press his fort. He says, to maintain discipleship, one must not permit anything to come between himself and Christ. That's the proposition. So Jesus' third teaching deals with the disciples' service in verse 24. And in verse 24, he says, no one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve 
God and mammon. And this verse then answers the question that can easily arise in the heart of, of anyone wanting to follow after Jesus, anyone who wants to receive and respond to his call of discipleship. Here's the question, and we need to see ourselves in relation to it. And are we even asking it? The question is, why can't we love Christ and earthly goods together? Why can't we have both or do both? Why can't discipleship be Christ plus material possessions and and or Christ plus earthly goods? And what Jesus explains in verse 24 is that the heart is made for one master only. God made us a certain way, and the heart can only be consumed with one master alone, and that master will be the person's God. And that's why you can't serve Christ plus mammon, material things in which one trusts mammon. The threat is that material things will bid for our hearts. And then we've already seen that. But here's the new thing. When material things get the heart, when material things capture the person's devotion, they become God. The person will love that and hate any other competitor because the heart is made for one devotion only. person will love that and hate the other. The heart has room only for one God. We're talking about maintaining discipleship. We're talking about the discipleship, the call of Jesus Christ. The initial call, follow me. What's that entail, Lord? It entails what Jesus said in Luke 14. That a disciple must deny himself, must take up his cross and follow him. If a person is going to be a disciple, if a person is going to be a Christian, he must know the cost. That person must know the cost of discipleship. It's not merely a decision that we make with our minds. It's a life kind of decision where we choose to follow Jesus Christ and leave our sin. So we repent and put our trust in Him only. We follow Him. That's the call. And then maintaining that discipleship. There are the positive side to that. We know the positive side. All the spiritual disciplines that we talk about frequently, being in God's Word, being in fellowship with God's people, worshiping together with God's people, prayer, telling others of the Lord, walking in obedience, observing the ordinances. All of these means of grace, the positive ways of maintaining our discipleship. But we've talked about the negative way of which we have to avoid things in order to preserve and maintain our discipleship today. We maintain our discipleship by not allowing things between us and Jesus Christ. First, we have to turn to Christ, and then we follow him all our days. And we work so that we are not hindered in our communion and fellowship with Him. You get it? Understand that? Let's pray. Father, we pray your blessing on your word. 
And Lord, we pray your blessing on this next part when I turn our attention to the observance of the Lord's table and we ask, Lord, that again, that you, in a special way, use this time, Lord, to strengthen your people, encourage your people, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.